Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Adventures Weekly. Today, tonight, we are catching up with Nina Curtis. Not only is she a silver medalist in the women's match racing, she's done at least half, half of an ocean race with Team Brunel, and she's now one of the amazingly talented sailors that is sailing with the Sail GP circuit on the line, direct from Hotel Quarantine, we have Nina Curtis. How are you? I'm good. As good as you can be Hotel Quarantine. So oh. I'm in my second week now, so I'm getting there. Far out. I know. The nightmare of Hotel Quarantine, it's definitely something you've been trying to avoid because you've been in Europe for five months and Asia. Yeah, it's been a five-month trip and I really am looking forward to getting out here um, but I'm on the home stretch and it's been a really rewarding um, five months like action-packed and so I could have actually used the downtime so it's not all terrible and I'm really looking forward to getting out in a few days. Indeed now talk to me about the past few months you're in hotel quarantine now but you've done things like the Sal GP obviously we'll come back to that the Moth Worlds and I saw you in Tokyo and we've pretty much been in lockdown here in Australia since that time. So you're coming home at the right time also. Yeah, I timed it perfectly, didn't I? You know, everything's opening up. Um, it's, I'm so lucky that, you know, everyone at home now can, you know, be free. I've been really feeling for everyone at home. So, yeah, just sliding in at the right time and <laughs> just looking forward to catching up with everyone. But, yeah, it's been a long trip. I also had, you know, a a five month, a uh, five week training camp in Lake Garda on a flying phantom with Luke Parkinson and um, also did, uh, you know, nearly a boat builders course with um, Kyle Langford in Sweden. And it's just been, um, I feel like I've gone to my sailing apprenticeship again for the last five months. And it's been really awesome. You've had a few of those opportunities. And let me just say right off the bat, you've had a few of these opportunities because you really put yourself out there. And, and I think that's something that we all admire in you. Uh, but talk to me a few, uh, talk to me about a few of the things over the past few years. So we'll just go back briefly through your history, how you grew up, how you came on this massive journey to now be one of the Women Pathway Program members for the Sao GP. Yes, I got it right. It's good. It's a mouthful, isn't it? The yeah. WPP athletes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I grew up on Pitwater and both of my parents were keen sailors and both of them had parents that were really passionate about sailing. So it was um, pretty natural for me and my brother to, to start sailing quite young and you know, we, we loved it as kids. I was always sailing with really good friends and um, having adventures and causing trouble out on the water. And it was really great. When I was about 15, I started at Royal Prince Alfred Yacht Club and they have a youth development program, which kind of came at the right time for me. I was 15 and keen to, um, you know, go and travel and do some big regattas. And that was all based around match racing. So I was doing that squad for four years before very luckily, you know, the Olympic women's match racing came into play. So I was kind of at the right place at the right time. I was already touring with two of the, um, you know, strongest skippers at the time um, and traveling overseas with them. And so I naturally fell into that squad. And, you know, four years later, it was a bit of a, well, you were there, <laughs> it was a bit of a journey. Yeah. Um, uh, lucky enough to get selected and then go and represent Australia at the London Olympics, which was incredible and even more incredible and uh, to come away with a silver medal. It's um, only in hindsight and only probably our failed Olympic campaign, you know, in, in the following four years that you really realise how much has to go right for, for stuff like that to fall into place. So. Um, so yeah, following that, I jumped into the 49er FX and the NACRA class both at once. Um, a decision though, even though I didn't get selected in either of the classes, I probably would do the exact same again. It put me on a really steep learning curve. I obviously had to transition from match racing to fleet racing, also from hiking to trapezing and going quite slow to going quite fast. So it was um, a big adjustment and 
I got to sail with some incredible people over those four years, including Darren Bundock and Hayley Outeridge and Josh McKnight, even there for a little bit, um, and just tried to get as much experience as I could. Um, didn't get selected in either class and not from lack of trying. We gave it a good fight in um, both classes, but ended up doing one more season of FX sailing before just feeling a ton of burnout. It all kind of hit me at once. And it was m not so much burnout from sailing, but definitely burnout from, from Olympic sailing. It can really take its toll. So I started working as a personal trainer in Washington, DC just for a change of scenery and um, trying to get a bit of money behind behind me, <laughs> trying to make some savings. And um, I was lucky enough that I got the call up while I was working in DC to join Team Brunel uh, for the Volvo Ocean Race. I had signed up for the trial, but missed it because I was still campaigning for the FX. So I think that, you know, I was lucky that I was still kind of in the list, even though I didn't get the trial, but I was a huge wild card for them and pretty grateful that they took a chance on me. And I um, definitely didn't set the world on fire straight off the bat. It was a really steep learning curve. I hadn't done, you know, much more yachting than a few Sydney to Hobarts and, you know, lots of East Coast races. So it was very different and 20 times longer than any race that I'd ever done. <laughs> and um, yeah, but, you know, the promise was one, was one leg and we'll see how it goes. And I obviously, you know, made some improvements because they kept me on for the remainder of the race, which is, you know, something I was incredibly proud of to, you know, hold on to that position and, and be there um, with the team right up until the finish. Yeah, those in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, very cool. And actually that last adventure uh, with Team Brunel is the, the first time you've said you were proud of yourself, which is interesting along that whole journey. Uh, you said you were lucky that, it happened at this time and you were lucky that this happened at that time but as many female sailors will know especially and i'm not saying guys sailors aren't resilient either but a lot of females have to be resilient to keep on trucking so you know what what made you keep going even through all of those i mean you had a lot of wins in there but there's a lot of setbacks too yeah absolutely the um the olympic campaigning was probably you know, some of the more, a bit more of a gruel, grueling fight. And, you know, the season of the women's match racing medal really kind of, it just takes it out of you. You're, we started with, I think, 25 girls and ended up with three at the end. And it was a long old journey to get through that. And what a short one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mick. <laughs> Um, I was longer than some. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah. I no, felt long. It was brutal. I, I, brutal. I can feel for you there. And, and we were all behind you. Well, I personally was. I mean, I, I was there when you guys were, were heading off to, to London. It was massive, though, because you three became representatives of that entire squad. So, you know, to go and get a silver medal... I'm not saying it was me, but I felt like that whole squad was responsible for helping you guys to get that medal in a way because we, we well, pushed absolutely. hard. You learn, and you learn something off everyone. And so, you know, the remaining three people were carrying a tremendous amount of, you know, skills learned and lessons learned, you know, from the backing of the rest of the team. And it's, you're so right. And we were so strong walking into there because of the huge amount of female sailors that had got rinsed in the process. Yeah, hundred percent. Unfortunately, I hope I, I hope or I wished that more of those women would stick around. I mean, but when you look at a lot of the women that are in sailing at our age uh, in Australia, especially, they're from that squad. If you look globally at the women that are in sailing that are our age, they've all sailed a Yingling or done match racing, or then been involved with an ocean race, and then so on and so forth. So there's this particular pool of female sailors that seem to have pushed through. I mean, is there any merit to that? Yeah, I think we saw it, the, the, um, the Dutch women's match racing ran the exact same program and I think they saw those exact same things. But I think it, even this, this issue with women in sport, it goes um, further than even in sailing. You know, you have this massive dropout 
you have a big one after school and then you have an even bigger one you know once um females are in the workplace and a big part of that is that there's so there's so few people in sailing especially that are able to make a career out of it there's not a whole yeah. lot of money and there's not a whole lot of opportunity and I feel like right now we're at that point of change where you know nearly over three elements of that high performance sailing like the olympics has been there and it's always been a really good um platform for females to prove themselves um and you know get treated as equals all the way through their journey but um in terms of like ocean racing and then also um america's cup or whatever we like to call it it's in sail gp right now they're just there hasn't there've been glimmers of it over the years and but nothing you know that's setting up um something that young females can be like i want to do that in this and um i just it's incredible to to be there i wish i was 10 years younger i'd give you that much <laughs> but you um, wish you were 10 years younger <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah. then you, you you're spot on because for someone like me who didn't want to leave sailing but perhaps wasn't, and I'm not unskilled. I've, I've still won some major titles, but to continue going on at a professional level in sailing, I chose to do media and to support the sport as best I could in this role, which is sort of normal, but I'm still a minority as such in, in media, in sailing even, or as a female in sport broadcasting. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an issue all the way through the sector and you're right, not just sailing. So I think um, you and I have spoken a lot about this in cab rides in between the hotel <laughs> and the Olympic venue when we were over there. But I think um, the female program that you're involved with at the Sail GP, from what I've heard, it sounds like a really um, collaborative group as well, which perhaps is a really good sign of things to come as opposed to really competitive fighting against each other for a select amount of spots yeah the um every i mean i've known a lot of the females in the sail gp um pool at at the moment uh, for a long time but there's um just an incredible feeling and it even goes bigger than this you know we mm. it started you know even in the moth world so there were 12 females putting, and that was the biggest number of female participation they're all celebrating it i'm like there's there's like nearly i think there's like 170 sailors yeah. here and you're proud that there's 12 girls i'm like we're not even close you know it's disgraceful and you know the boats are expensive it's an in inaccessible class and the suit you know the pe humans the 50 to you know 75 kilos it's just not set up for it so uh, this for the just five past five months i can just you can really feel the energy of the females that are we're all on the edge we're all on the cusp it's you know we're making change and happening but we're impatient we're hungry and it's just <laughs> happening too slowly you know yeah. but at least it's happening so it's exciting yeah exactly and let me tell you the dawn riley's and the tracy edwards's and the kay cotties and all of these women that i'm lucky enough to talk to frequently uh you know they wish they were 20 years younger <laughs> yeah. uh, what i mean what would you given that we're on the edge what do you want to see change what do you think we need to do? I mean, and no pressure, you can just chuck ideas out there because we're all trying to solve this problem, but I feel like you're living it then, and most of us don't have that opportunity. For me, some of my biggest learning experience has been in mixed gender mm. um, competition. Mm. And so when, go back to when I was doing the youth development program, you know, the, there were, let's say, it was like 60% male, maybe 40% female. And I think it's leveled out. Um, even by the time I'd left, it was it was quite equal. And, um, you know, so you're in there and there's a level of expectation that you've got to be, you've all got, equally got to be as good as each other. It's not just about the females getting as good as the females and the males as the males. It's just this nice um, leveler. And, the you know, the females would really, um, you know, probably pick the boys up in terms of like maturity and communication and and timing and you know these things that 
you know, you get good at as a girl and the boys, you know, probably bring in a little bit of aggression and, um, you know, more of that kind of fight. And so, you know, you'd learn off everyone really equally that way. And I do think that that set me up really well, you know, when we started campaigning um, in women's match racing because the bar had been set so high as a, as a youth sailor. And then again, you know, you get thrown crew 17. Um, I was with Darren Bundock and, you know, he's, his last crew was Glenn Ashby. Like he's <laughs> one of the best goddamn crews in the world. And the, the bar was set really high and, it, you know, it's just not good enough to not be good enough. And so, again, you know, you really get levelled up. Mm. And I have found the same in the ocean racing. And so in terms of, I don't feel like, you know, the future of female sailing has to be mixed gender, mm. but in terms of bridging a gender gap, I really don't think that there's a more efficient way than throwing females in with males and say swim, you know, and you'll yeah. sink for a little bit and then swim and then you'll get as good as you need to be because, you know, you, you'll have, you know, you're a part of that team then you feel responsible and, you know, you, you perhaps have, you know, taken a position of a very qualified male and you feel responsible to um, sell as well, if not better. And so yeah. to me, yeah, in terms of bridging gender gaps, that's, um, been it's been my experience and mm. it's been a really positive experience for me. Hundred percent. I am. Um, I come from a rural background, so my choice was to sail on my own in a manly junior. Sail on my own on a laser with the <laughs> sail wrapped up. Sail on a manly junior with a guy, or sail with my dad on a taser, which I did and still do. And you know, so so that was that. And that's how I got into sailing. And I didn't know there was anything different. I didn't know no. being the only sailor girl, hence the nickname, at the yacht club was a thing. Um, you just sort of got on with it. And I'm not saying that anybody's had a good or a bad or, a, you know, there wasn't a, a female shower. Um, you know, we, we all grew up with things like that. But getting leveled up and having to compete against all the guys at my club to crew for my dad was a big thing. So I think that was really good as a, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old, 11 year old. I think I did my first worlds when I was 11. Um, couldn't get my bottom over the side on a taser at that point. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, but some amazing experiences now for you in the Sail GP. And I'm going to bring up this photo and, and I like to refer to them, you know, the, the women's pathway program. I just like to refer to this group of amazing women as sailors. That's just my personal preference. And um, you, you're welcome to, a, to agree or disagree. But I did love these photos, Nina, because you, you're still rocking your pink runners. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, you got to keep it classy, don't you? When you, your whole uniform was given to you, but I had the freedom of my shoes and I'm like, oh, well, they're going to be bright pink. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. But uh, the event that you've just had in Cardiz, absolutely nuts. Not only were you uh, one of the first women to be on board, because all respect to Marie Rial, who was on in season one with the French team for the whole entire season. Now we've got a, a female on each team, but you're the first female to be on board a winning team, which is pretty special. And it was a very spicy final. Nick, it was a spicy weekend, you know. <laughs> Even the day, you know, we had that race where um, the female athletes were put uh, in that grinding position, something I've been fighting for all year. I yeah. have had sent many well-written, strongly worded emails and trying to get in the ear of everyone. And I was just like, well, we're sailing with three people. What's, what's an extra, you know, 60-something kilos? You're not going to notice it. Give us a chance in these conditions. Next minute, I'm on the start line with the to do my <laughs> being like, God, I've been fighting for this for a long time and I'm really nervous. <laughs> but it's not but the first great. time. It's not the first time that you fought to be in the Sal GP because I've heard that in season one, you were like, come on, Slingsby, give me a go. Have you on the team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as I'd heard about Sal GP, you know, I love the concept. I was, I just, would have given anything to get on board those boats. And so, yeah, I'd been um, short of harassing Tom to give me a trial. And, you know, you can't, like, there's absolutely no disrespect for Tom because if you were going to choose 
Carl Langford or Jason Waterhouse or, you know, any of the guys on board, Sam Newton, Kinley Fowler, like they are rock stars. And even yeah. though, you know, I grew up sailing with all of them and we had an equal start, our paths have been completely different. And they just spent the last six years, you know, designing the craft that we're sailing. Like you don't stand a chance. And unfortunately, that's just the nature of this gender gap is that, you know, these experience in, in these boats had previously been shut to us. And so, yeah, it, I, you know, I wish I got a trial, but, you know, when he said, oh, this is our lineup, I'm really sorry, we're, we're all sorted. You just can't, I couldn't argue with that. And, yeah. um, but I was lucky that they reached out to me, um, you know, when the announcement had happened and been like, oh, have you heard? I'm like, yeah, I've heard, I've already applied, guys, I'm there. <laughs> I'm already at your door with the letter. Yeah. Now, um, you just mentioned there that these guys have been designing it and it was, interesting because we've spoken personally about you know some of the jobs on board that might be might be more suited than grinding though you still nailed it uh was flight controller and or trimming the wing and Carl Langford was integral in helping to design these wings as far back as you know Oracle Team USA in San Francisco so you you know you you're trying to take the spot of somebody who basically invented that system so it's pretty crazy yeah I've been pretty transparent with the guys that, you know, if if I was coming into a blank team that I, I'm, I'm a trimmer, I get so much joy from trimming sails and, you know, would obviously um, love that wing, um, you know, that wing position. But the problem is I don't have the experience in that fast racing tactics. And, you know, that's a huge, it's a huge gap to close. And I'd like to, you know, eventually do that in the future but right now i can really see that that flight controller position is a little bit more accessible and also still a set of skills that i do believe that i've got and so it's um yeah it's been great i in the last event i did get quite a bit of time um on the flight controller and i would improved quite a lot from last time you know you get these small little pockets with a few months in between and then you get the opportunity again and you're like please god let me remember what i remembered last time you know and um, I did, I did improve, and I am starting to get manoeuvres now. Yeah, um, from tack to tack and jibe to jibe, which is tremendous juggle between you trimming the main and you've got a board and you've got to communicate something else, and it's just like sensory overload. But it's um, it's it's such a cool role, and yeah, I'm really hoping that you know with a bit more time, there's a few more initiatives getting rolled out. Um, I think before the San Fran event mm -hmm. that um, are really exciting for the females. I, I um, think that they're really taking this pathway seriously. Mm. And um, the Australian team has always take, like, taken it very seriously. I've been so welcomed into the team. So it's gonna be really exciting to see these female athletes and hopefully many more to follow, um, you know, just get this opportunity and run with it. For sure. And speaking of exciting and opportunities, before we go any further, I think we're going to watch that last race and, um, and then we're going to come <laughs> back and talk about it. And, and opportunities, I think you're probably a really good example to that Australian team is, like you said, you started at a very similar point. It's not that you're not resilient. It's not that you're an exceptional go-getter. So it's not like you've taken every opportunity that's come, in your, come your way. They've just been slightly different. So... It's probably actually really good for them to have that reality check. <laughs> You're a good example. So let's have a look at the, the last race. I'm going to leave your mic on. So if you feel like saying anything, uh, go nuts. <laughs> We're going to commentate this for you. Here you go. Nina Curtis and Nick Douglas commentating uh, the last race at the Sao GP in Cardiz. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. GBR off to a flying start. What was happening there, Nina? Down to Leward. <laughs> What's happening? Oh my goodness, they just didn't get the jib off fast enough and it was absolutely catastrophic. You can see in that one how hard we had to keep clear there. We were really lucky that, um, you know, we got out of dodge. There's another good shot of it there. But, um, oh, it just it can go wrong so easily in those conditions. I cannot express that enough. These guys are 
so clever to be able to sail in those conditions. And um, we got a little taste of it because to be completely frank, I have never sailed in those conditions and neither had any of the others. So we're in the biggest deep end ever and it was wild and so much fun and we all learnt so much and came off with big smiles on our faces, even Hannah who survived that capsize. Oh, I but love Hannah, she's a legend. <laughs> it just happened so quickly yeah. that, that that capsize was just, and it just goes to show that, you know, like uh, pressing a foot pedal for five seconds or, um, you know, the helm having the reaction and knowing the boat well enough to not, you know, if Tom reacts too hard, we go in, you know, sidewards over them, which is even oh. more gnarly. And the same for James, like he had to shut his boat down um, after he kept clear there, he got stuck. Uh, up the top for quite a long time. And it is so extremely on the edge in those conditions. I just, oh. yeah, I came let's off keep the boat kind of <laughs> in shock. Press play, let's see some more. All right, we're gonna keep watching. And like on the side panel here, cause I've got all the panels, I've literally just got GBR sideways as you're like, it's so exciting. I'm like, I know, <laughs> here they are. We got more views of this. I literally put every single view I could find of the capsize in for you. And there's Hannah on the back, as you said. Oy. I I do love this because you see her just go, oh, we're going in. And she sucks herself into the capsule. <laughs> oh, golly. Hang on Had a, a huge moment. Ew. And, you know, just after that moment, um, all the, I'm like, the capsized and the boys are like, okay, yeah. And then um, someone said, oh, should we, should we back off a little bit? And yeah. I think it was Jace who's like, what do you mean with back off? Like, there's only <laughs> one way to do this and it's full speed. And so we just <laughs> ripped it round, but it's true. There's no, um, you can't back off. It gets even more dangerous. So you get the rest of the race absolutely yeah. ripping around at full speed and that was the safest option for us to get out get around the course and stay out of trouble <laughs> yeah i think we we all heard it too because you hear this oh should we keep racing i think it was tom who said it and yeah, yeah. And it was like no we're still going because <laughs> jason's okay. terrified his job gets so much harder when they're not going full speed. And so he's just like, hell no, <laughs> full speed, please. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a really good lesson in sailing. And we'll come back to that when we're talking about the, the gender gap as well. It's sort of like full send is the only way to go. <laughs> Gotta go full send. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Windship, but on these boats, yeah. yeah, it's full speed or nothing. Oh, nuts. And here's, the USA, they finally managed to get back up after that boat shut down. But you guys were about, I don't know, a nautical mile in front by then. Yeah, we had a really strong lead and it was quite bizarre. It kind of took all my jobs out of my hand. I had a really easy race after everyone uh, got wiped out. But I, What are you putting out here? You're pointing, that was really cute. Oh yeah, there's, I, I'm like, don't hit that boat. Don't hit that camera boat, please. <laughs> Yes, we've won, but don't hit that. So that was an important job, see, Nines. It's all good. Yeah, and hang on, yeah, I've got exactly. a little... I think I can... I'll come back to you for a second and I'm going to fast forward to when you actually... This is this is the worst bit of your day, but the best bit of your day. I mean, what happened here? Everyone just decided... Hang on, I'm going to fast forward a bit. Everyone just decided that it was pick on Nina with the champagne day. We don't need to do this thing for you. Kinley. <laughs> Kinley What's got this? me so In good. Your face. Yeah, yeah, and, again. and then he just kept coming for more. <laughs> and then do you know what happened after that? Because I didn't never saw him. And yeah. I said to him after, I'm like, some I like we're trying to get out of my eyes. I'm like, someone smashed me with the champagne. And he's like, Oh, really? Like, <laughs> who do you think it was? <laughs> and it wasn't until I saw the video like that night that I was like, Kinley, you dog. <laughs> <laughs> It was hilarious. And then on the podium as well, everyone was after you and you're just standing at the side going, please stop. My eyes are still recovering. It was gold. I love it. I know. So, yeah. yeah. They take no prisoners, the boys. It's good. I'm treated very equally. And sometimes it's not as fun, like when you're getting yeah. smashed with champagne. But, but it was really cool too. Great banter among the Australian team and lovely to see you guys leading as you're heading home. 
you did an awesome Instagram takeover too, which I know Marco got into you about, which was really fun. Uh, so much, so much fun, the team. Uh, I mean, it's just obviously lots of mutual respect there, which is so lovely. And they're good characters too, you know. <laughs> it's um, so serious on board the boat and especially during racing. But even in training, it's still super serious. And so it's nice to have that like counterbalance. We've got a lot of larrikins on the team. And so it's, um, yeah, it's really good, that balancing factor. Excellent. Well, I'm going to show the interview with you from straight after racing when you're covered in champagne and salt water and everything else. So we'll have a little look at that. And then we're going to have a, a quick chat. So think about this while we're watching this interview. You're going to think about the top three things that you would do or advise to try and get more girls up to a, a point where someone such as yourself is, is sailing at. So have a think about that while we watch you completely okay. frothing Nina Frothing Curtis <laughs> out on her day <laughs> winning the South GP. I was never scared, but it was very intense and it took a lot of focus to kind of stay with um, on top of all the things that were happening on board the boat. I was holding on damn tight and really taking my time across the boat, but you don't want to take too much time because that's also pretty sketchy, so yeah. Yeah, and it's the safest place to be when everything's a little bit variable because, you know, the risk is when you're behind the skipper that if you do fall, you wipe him out and it gets exponentially worse. So you're really trying to back and brace. And so, yeah, you're staying down unless you need to check anything. But yeah, <laughs> being really well trained and, you know, all the guys, we kind of spoke about it. The, one of the sketchiest parts of the day was actually getting out, yeah, and that's where a lot of the teams had some big um, big hit down. So before we went out, we we're all like, air's working, yeah, this is where we unhook, yeah. So we're, you know, we're, it's at the forefront of your mind on a day like today. Like, there's just so many things. Like, we saw all the positions, we saw all the wind conditions, and it was just, um, yeah, as you said, baptism of fire. Um, yeah, today was the windiest uh, and craziest I've ever sailed in. We sailed in a lot of sea state um, before the last event, but in terms of, it's a whole new world when you're racing on board these boats and you're pushing the limits so much more than training. So yeah, it was um, incredible. Yeah, one of my best days of my life. <laughs> Yeah, quite a lot. Sydney's going to be a tough one uh, for the females on the athlete program because it's um, going to be a really hard for us to get into there. But it's actually a really good opportunity for me. I will be there with the team and I'm looking forward to um, really stepping up the training and hopefully getting a few more training hours in. Yeah. Best day of your life ever. <laughs> Nina Frothing Curtis. <laughs> God, I just love it, don't I? I can't get yeah. enough. <laughs> you do. And you mentioned there, and that's something I'm going to pick up on before we finish up. Please tell me that there's more WPP athletes coming to Australia now that the border's opening from 1 November. It's, um, it's not decided yet. So mm. obviously in the press releases, they said, you know, Cadiz and then San Francisco. And that's because it's been a real uphill battle for Sail GP mm. to get everyone in it involves a big application to the government and yeah. you know it's quite challenging so it, everyone is aware of how big an impact we made in Cadiz and how much of a setback it is to not be in Sydney and now it's you know it's kind of out of our hands it's what um, is allowed in the time frame and so I've got my fingers crossed and something I've also been fighting for very hard in quarantine so um, you know, I've said everything I've had to say, and I know that the team at SailGP are, are really putting in the good fight for that. So just yeah. cross your fingers and, and hope oh, it happens. Trust me. I'm like, please, yeah. please, please. And now here's the hard question. Three, three things. I mean, I've, I've asked you about resilience. I've asked you about momentum and just keeping on pushing. We've touched on opportunities versus you know, mixed sailing versus ocean racing, fast sailing, match racing, so many different things. I mean, I know you have your yes policy. And for those who haven't watched an interview with Nina before, she's very much about saying yes to everything. So we'll-, we'll You're we'll stealing my first answer, Nick. Stealing your first <laughs> answer. All right, go, go for it, three things. Yeah, well, I'm the yes lady. 
as mm. um, I just think that every op I've never regretted an opportunity I've said yes to and um, and you just never know where it leads and who you might meet or who you might learn from and um, sometimes some of the biggest um, opportunities have come from really unsuspecting areas and I also think that the more well-rounded you are as a sailor in terms of boats you've sailed on people you've sailed with or even positions like you think you know you're going to be a crew forever there's nothing better for crews than to steer and vice versa i think for helmsmen to crew and jump in different positions so that's always my absolute number one yeah um in terms of other things i just think that it's been the first time that there's looks like there's pathways now in, yeah. in ocean racing and in America's Cup style. And so to me, I think that that's an advantage that as a female sailor, you don't, um, you know, have to chase pathways that might not be best suited to you. You could probably start, you know, now um, sh shaping what you want and trying to gather skills in, in, you know, in the hope that you could have a professional career uh in any element of sailing um that comes and so i think it's an exciting time for that and it's yeah. perhaps you know not not proven yet but i think you'd have a huge step up if if that's what you really want um you know kind of creating your own destiny by doing the sailing that will suit where you're going you know trying to get in contact with people who are doing it and ask what they do and how they upskill mm -hmm. and how they train because i think that you know that's a that's something that's um, available to female athletes now that it haven't been before. And um, number three is don't be afraid to make mistakes. And you've got to have thick skin and make lots of mistakes and wear them proudly like a, I don't know, badge of honour. Like nobody is that good in sa sailing. so variable. You can never be the best. You're always going to make mistakes, even if you're the, you know, number one sailor in the world and so I just think that um, if you're like too proud or too defensive of you know where you perceive yourself uh, on a boat or in a hierarchy I just think that you're really closing yourself off to um, learning as much as possible so just you got to be tough and you know criticism sucks and sometimes you cannot be in the mood for it but you just got to kind of build that thick skin and just remember that you know they're it's like information that will make you a better sailor and not someone, you know, trying to make you feel bad if you're having a bad day. So I think they're, they're good. They're three good things. I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. So say yes, ask questions and try different opportunities and become a well-rounded sailor. I'm going to add that in to number one. <laughs> nice. And uh, Perfect. so that there's sort of two points there. So I'll give you that given I, I broke out, say yes. Um, and then, for me, I'm so happy you went and did the Moss Worlds. <laughs> <laughs> Eight hours of sailing, goes and races the Moss Worlds because we're in Tokyo. Should I go and do it? I'm really nervous. Go and do it. Go and do it. Go and do it. <laughs> so good. Um, I'm a sucker for punishment. And it was, oh. yeah, I did not set the world on fire nor do any, any good bet. You know, it's the same. It's about having thick skin and being ready to make lots of mistakes and, and get better. It's a good example of me doing the moth worlds. <laughs> but I think, I think it's a really good point there that you said, which was point number two, which is set yourself up for the pathway that you want. You don't have to go Olympic as a female sailor anymore. That was our only option for a very long time. Nina and I are very much in the same boat as that. Um, you know, and for people like Karen Gonich, who's leading leading the way in a lot of female initiatives in New South Wales as well. She was one of the first, well, she was the first female with Nikki Bethwaite to represent Australia in sailing at the Olympics. And before that, they didn't even have that opportunity. So we're, we're gradually getting there, but that's, that's so cool. I mean, I've seen there's a double handed entry to the Hobart that's all female, which is fantastic. You can do your yes. short handed sailing. Yeah. You've got your short handed sailing. You've got, uh, potential Sal GP pathways. You've got a Women's America's Cup potentially coming up. You've got ocean racing. You've got dinghy racing. You've got wasps. You've got moths. You've got so many different ways to get involved with the sport. And that's such a special thing, I think. So 
Yeah. So refreshing, so overdue, and it's so exciting. It is very, very exciting. And it was also very exciting to catch up with you today. I've missed you. <laughs> yeah, it's been good, Nick. Oh, I, wasn't I your first podcast on your list? You showed me the photo. You were my first podcast. If you have a look on iTunes and Spotify and you go back to 2014, <laughs> there's Nina Curtis telling me about her new Olympic campaign on an FX and a NACRA. She can't decide. <laughs> it's cold. And there's a lot that's come in between um, then and now, that's for sure. Um, from I was talking about when I met you the other day, actually, because I used to coach up at Royal Prince Alfred Yacht Club and I wasn't on the youth program because I'd come from out of town. But we were both coaching Friday afternoon, learn to sail classes, and then we ended up sailing together. And then I ended up interviewing you and now you're a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Oh, but the cool thing is, Neens, that people like you uh, and the other women that are on the WPP program and the Abby Aylers of the world and those who've come before them, you know, we, we now have female people in the sport to look up to as well and more of them, which is so cool. And you're one of those, like you said, that girls can look at and go, I don't have to go Olympic. I could do this or this or this a multi-hull a monohull it doesn't matter so so you know, good no it's, it's so special. exciting yeah it yeah and um what i'm going to do now is bring up a pretty special picture of you signing an autograph part of the inspire program in Cardiz, and i think that's what it's all about so we'll sign off on that photo nina curtis nina frothing curtis lovely to have had you on the show this afternoon thanks nick it's been a pleasure